This is Dr. Sargisian, and today we'll talk about alteration of digestive system. And uh, this is an overview of uh, digestive system, uh, and which also includes liver and pancreas. One of the most common disorders uh, an alteration of GI system is gastrointestinal bleeding. So bleeding can be upper and lower. And upper we consider uh, esophagus, stomach, or duodenum. And lower GI bleed is below the ligament of treats or bleeding of jejunum, ileum, colon, or rectum. So that ligament of treats is kind of the border, and also the color of the bleed may change, like the brighter the blood is, the lower it is, and uh, you know, this is kind of uh, one of those nursing things you know from day one you started working as a nurse, or the first month you uh, definitely had someone with GI bleed presenting and uh, um, patient if they have hemat uh, upper GI bleed they may present with hematemesis which is bright red blood vomiting uh, coughing up blood sometimes can be confused as hematemesis and uh, um, coughing up blood is not hematemesis. When you're taking patient's history, please ask to clarify where the blood's coming from because sometimes patients would see blood, they said, oh yeah, the blood came out of my mouth, but it was hemat, not hematemesis, it was hemoptysis. So uh, perfuse bleeding for, uh, during the vomiting or per blood mixed with uh, vomit or perfused blood, it's hematemesis. Also, hematemesis is considered when patient is having coffee ground emesis, somewhat digested blood in the stomach, but ca patient uh, vomiting that, also not a good sign. Remember that this is medical emergency, no questions asked. Th this is one of the things you have to uh, transport patient to ER as fast as you can and the patient need to have upper endoscopy with cauterization or whatever needs to be done to stop it because there may be several causes for this not just ulcers bleeding hematochesia is blood in the stool so um, sometimes people would call hematochesia melana, which is not correct. It's a profuse red blood in a stool. Melana is dark, tarry stools, black stools. You don't really have no way to say that melana is blood in the stool, but the definitely, or most of the time, melana is blood in the stool, the black tarry appearance. However, let's say with overuse with of peptobismol, patient may present with black stools, tarry stools. So uh, another history taking um, hint, if patient complains of melana, they say they have black tarry stool, make sure that they weren't taking uh, peptobismol uh, or uh, any other bismuth preparations which can discolor the stools. Occult bleeding is occult. You don't see it by um, when you are observing the stools, when you are examining the stools. However, it can be showing up on occult blood testing. And uh, occult bleeding is a concerning sign because this may be representing a bleeding malignancy and representing colon cancer. So that's our upper and lower GI bleeds. Occult bleeding can be slow upper GI bleed. Uh, it even can come from dental uh, disorders. Uh, or for example, patient had a tooth extraction and then had a occult bleeding testing and it came positive 
probably it's a good idea with that history to wait a couple of more days and redo the occult bleeding testing, hemocult testing. Uh, but uh, even tooth extraction and swallowing some blood may result in occult bleeding or occult hemocult positive test, which doesn't mean that bleeding comes from um, colon cancer or an ulcer or something like that. So overall, um, upper GI and lower GI bleeds uh, should be considered an R medical emergencies because there is a risk of uh, perforation, the risk of um, uh, losing blood and profuse blood loss anemia. Occult bleeding, on the other hand, it's not medical emergency. However, it may represent a serious condition like cancer and should be addressed fairly quickly and evaluated. In both cases, um, in lower and upper uh, endoscopy, lower and upper is uh, indicated for further evaluation. With occult bleeding, patient needs to proceed with a thorough diagnostic workup that will include CBC and uh, to check for anemias and um, also by CBC I mean truly hemoglobin and hematocrit plus the um, um, reds RDW and check for uh, hypochromic and um, microcytic anemias, you know, size cells, uh, MCB, MCHC, uh, those type of things. But uh, CBC also will be, may, with differential, may be useful because if there are some type of cancer to look for uh, unusual white cells. But at the same time, a cold bleeding may warrant both upper and lower GI to further evaluate for the source of bleeding. Dysphagia is difficulty swallowing, and um, there are two types of this, mechanical obstruction and functional obstruction. When we're talking about mechanical obstruction, this is some type of narrowing of esophagus, some type of stricture or a ring such as like Schatzky ring, a ring of connective tissue, scar tissue that occurred and usually this is a consequence of uh, gastroesophageal reflex disease. Another more concerning sequela or uh, pathophysiology uh, of dysphagia is having a um, malignancy or a benign tumor that causes obstruction and difficulty swallowing. Uh, so that's the dysphagia. So patient will have complaints such as food getting stuck right here and showing behind the sternum, may complain of chest pains uh, related to food ingestion. Of course, we are very vigilant about um, chest pains and you have to, every time is chest pain complaint, you have to distinguish, is this cardiac complaint? Is this emergency or is this something like a GI related definitely? So you have to examine the correlation of food ingestion of chest pain occurrence in this case. So, so food getting stuck, that will be the concern of patient. And sometimes patient would say, I have to rage, I have to vomit it and they will say that they are, they are having undigested food coming out. Achalasia is a very concerning disorder and it's a denervation of the smooth muscle in the esophagus and lower esophageal sphincter. And what happened um, during the achalasia, the esophagus collapses and turns into very narrow passage or completely closes. So during the achalasia, patient would uh, have uh, would have a uh, buildup of flu food bolus and eventually would vomit it. Patient will have complaints of inability to swallow, inability to swallow, and they will always rage. So 
again, dysphagia is difficult to swallow. And it's truly not related to pain. And the same in achalasia, they won't have the uh, difficulty, uh, I'm sorry, they won't have the complaints of pain, but they will be complaining of dysphagia, complaining of uh, inability to pass the food, and they have to retch and get the food out without digesting. They will. The complaint will be, I, I see the pieces of undigested food, and I, I see, you know, it just doesn't go through. And achalasia is fairly emergent condition, not fairly, it's, a, it's an urgent to emergent condition because patient does not have ability to have food intake sometimes, it's so tight. So even fluid intake will be difficult. And uh, patient may experience, if this is untreated, patient may experience severe weight loss, um, nutritional deficiencies. So this needs to be treated. And um, one of the treatments is uh, um, possibility of having bot Botox injection. And uh, besides the cosmetic, uh, Gastroesophageal reflux disease, it's also a disorder of motility. Uh, however, um, this is not dysphagia where food bolus cannot go down into stomach. It's opposite. The food bolus um, is going up. And it's reflex of chyme from the stomach to the esophagus. Um, chyme is acidic. Uh, substance, acidic mix. So esophagus isn't uh, designed to have exposure to the acid. So this causes all type of problems such as esophagitis or even strictures on rings, like I said, or even can predispose the patient for the esophageal malignancy. And um, Gastroesophageal reflex disease will cause inflammation of the esophagus and it will be called, of course, esophagitis. And the treatment uh, will may be directed to reduce acidity overall as well as to deal, to try to recreate lower esophageal sphincter um, functioning. Um, so that will be very... Uh, hiatal hernia. Hiatal hernia is sliding of the part of the stomach into uh, uh, chest cavity, basically through the diaphragm. And um, in this case, uh, it may slide sometime, or it may be paraesophageal, just non-sliding hiatal hernia. But uh, the problem is that lower esophageal sphincter is doesn't have the help or diaphragm around it so it's much much looser and my doesn't isn't able to hold um, the climb down and everything comes up unfortunately m lots of people have it the most uh, from empiric experiences, most people I saw having a EGD, they will have some degree of hiatal hernia. Um, if uh, it's paraesophageal hiatal hernia, it may be different manifestation than sliding hiatal hernia. But in both cases, gastroesophageal reflex disease symptoms can uh, be present. It, again, used to be very common to do Nissan fund duplication to try to deal with this and um, trying to reduce it, but it's a major surgical intervention and the uh, patient truly has to be very compliant with their lifestyle and for instance they cannot overeat or they cannot vomit with the Nissan fund duplication. That's why uh, nowadays it's one of the last resort treatments or surgical treatment for gastroesophageal reflux disease in general and hiatal hernia in particular. So you would uh, try medication first before introducing anything else like surgically. Peptic ulcer disease, it's uh, breakage or a break or ulceration of the mucosal lining 
in esophagus, stomach, or duodenum, and it can have acute character or chronic. Patient may have superficial erosions versus deep through ulcers. Ulcers may perforate and bleed, causing peritonitis in severe cases. Also, they can bleed inside and causing acute GI bleed, which is also emergency. But in all cases, peptic ulcer disease most of the time is related to H. pylori. Uh, this is a picture of chronic peptic ulcer. You see the appearance and the white marking on the edges. So basically mucosa is completely uh, destroyed and you see like there is some blood discharge going on. It's approximately two centimeters in length or, two, or even two and a half, almost an inch. Um, uh, and uh, this may be very concerning. Even if it's chronic, it may exacerbate and perforate. So this may be a chronic NSAID user, like goodies powder, most likely, or maybe something like, again, H. pylori infection, but or uh, all together H. pylori with NSAID abuse, with cigarette smoking, with alcohol, all together can cause this. But here you see typical white surrounding in the ulcers showing that the mucosal layer is already damaged. So it's truly uh, like the eventually what will happen a, this may heal, although highly unlikely, but it may worsen and perforate. And perforation will become into peritonitis and needs, again, emergent treatment patient will. So the key is to address this early, to save uh, patient trouble of dealing with peritonitis, to save them a uh, healthcare visit and all the consequences related to it. Duodenal ulcers are the most common ones, and uh, they will be in the duodenum, and uh, again, H. pylori will be one to blame. Um, basically, H. pylori is a very resilient bacteria that lives in acid and can produce toxins and enzymes that will be promoting inflammation and destruction and ulceration and also a, a hypersecretion of um, uh, hypochlo uh, I'm sorry chloric acid um, and pepsin will occur and say used to blend gastrin levels if one of the things may uh, be s promoting the hypersecretion of acid and also smoking we can blame on this too and uh, smoking also has indirect uh, effect on this because smokers uh, will have lower um, tolerance or they will require more stimulation of taste. So they would like spicier food, they will use more salt because unfortunately smoking or fortunately, I don't know, uh, smoking destroys the taste sensation so you would need more spice more if you are if you like hot foods you will like more hot and spicy food because your sensation is dull so that also will promote acid production so that's why smoking besides of that swallowing tar and uh, all byproducts of smoke will be irritating to stomach. But again, number one here is certainly H. pylori infection, which has to be treated. Duodenal ulcer, you see here how this penetrates through layers, um, the ulcer crater, and mucosa destroyed, and submucosa. It even goes through muscular coat that goes that deep and of course this can also perforate. This is a picture of EGD um, and esophageal gastroduodenoscopy and also it shows the location actual ulcer in duodenum. Um, so it's very interesting where 
it can be and uh, you see the blood vessels can be quite close to it I, I mean it's a relatively large vessel and this can cause in bleeding. The other problem here if ulcers appear and then self-heal, lots of connective tissue appears, this can cause um, pyloric, uh, not pyloric, but it will cause narrowing or stricturing in duodenum and inability to pass food. So patient may have uh, bowel obstruction related to this, so with all the consequences. So another surgical um, intervention probably would be needed. So uh, duodenal ulcers are common peptic ulcers. Again, again the same H. pylori to blame, NSAID use, o NSAID overuse. A uh, couple of words about NSAIDs. Goodies powder, most people who will present with peptic ulcers with goodies powder they don't think that goodies powder is really medication. They think it's just, you know, a powder, something like sugar you take when you have a headache, and some t or people would take it for arthri arthritic pain. But truly, um, there is no knowledge that it's a medicine. It's not some type of supplement. So that also, uh, in my empiric experience, it was most of this type of ulcers were caused by goodies powder. I don't know if there was research done, but empirically what I've seen, definitely I can say that yes, goodies powder was to blame. Or other NSAID preparations also may cause this. Gastric ulcers will develop in antral region uh, because it's adjacent to acid secreting mucosa of the body of the stomach. Antrum doesn't have that much acid secretion, so it's more, let's say, tender. Than, so more, um, it can be affected much more by acid than the body of the stomach. Um, again, H. pylori to br uh, br uh, blame, and its mucosal permeability to hydrogen ions and gastric secretion will be normal or less normal. Again, it may be even uh, sometimes more than normal, secondary to overproduction of gastrin. But uh, what happened, again, there is something else that causes gastric ulcers. That's, it's not just acid goes from nowhere and decides to, uh, I was saying, it's not like acid goes from nowhere and decides to um, attack the stomach uh, mucosa uh, uh, antrum of the stomach and uh, but there should be something like H. pylori or NSAIDs or stress induced ulcer and here's another picture of the ulcer and uh, you can see some bleeding very tiny small ulcer it doesn't have a scale here but you can see the bleeding in the stomach it's um, and you really cannot even say is this close to a perforation or not probably not but it's significant blood and this presumptively the photograph taken when patient was presenting with hematemesis because considering the amount of blood on this picture and the EGD has been done, and this is before they cauterize the ulcer. So let's talk about liver disorders. Uh, liver disorders can be lots of different liver disorders, but once we truly concern its uh, hepatitis and cirrhosis, and uh, depending on the disorder, patient may develop portal hypertension. What portal hypertension does, the blood pressure in portal vein or portal venous system increases because of the resistance to portal blood flow. So this is like in kidneys, can be prehepatic, intrahepatic, and posthepatic. 
In this class and lecture, I'd like to focus uh, on intrahepatic portal hypertension, secondary to cirrhosis and hepatitis, and prehepatic and posthepatic also happen, but they are not truly that common. Portal hypertension uh, by itself, it's, let's say it doesn't have uh, cardiac risk, however, it has very um, bad or negative consequences. What can happen uh, because of increased, increased hypertension, increased pressure in portal system, patient may develop viruses, esophageal viruses. In uh, so. It, uh, please uh, imagine, not imagine, but that's the true fact, like the portal veins, they go uh, coming, they go to stomach, intestine, spleen, and they merge into portal vein. And, and uh, the portal vein will branch, then go into the liver and get there. So uh, if in liver it gets obstructed, then patient will start building up the pressure and developing pressure in all pre-liver uh, parts of portal systems. So <coughs> the esophageal viruses may occur and also hemorrhoids may occur and um, splenic congestion or splenomegaly may occur and also ascites and hepatic encephalopathy because of the inability to get rid of waste products and uh, of uh, uh, ammonia in particular. So let's talk about viruses. Viruses can occur again in stomach and they can occur in rectum as hemorrhoids and lower esophagus. Most commonly they will occur in esoph esophagus and most by most commonly I mean the medical emergency wise they will occur in uh, esophagus. Viruses are very vulnerable in esophagus and they can open and break very easily if something, if patient has somewhat unusual uh, hard food bolus or for some reason they overate or without a, a reason really because portal veins and uh, they are not really uh, designed to have uh, that much pressure in them so they will be rupturing. Uh, if portal vein, if esophageal bleed occurs, again, sometime it's very difficult to stop and patient may unfortunately bleed out in addition to the, that uh, vomit and aspirate. So this is a true medical emergency. As this is when the, everyone moves very fast in the hospital, as you've probably seen. And uh, most of the, uh, I never, uh, seen and thank goodness patient being lost secondary to variceal rupture because we always would take care of it very fast but there are cases that it's not possible to address this because of the um, amount of the bleed and uh, of the significance uh, of the veins involved of how much blood we're losing and how far the patient is from healthcare facility. Esophageal bleed or variceal bleed can be stopped by uh, cauterization and banding of the viruses. And the banding technique, same technique, can be applied to hemorrhoids in rectum. The problem with uh, hemorrhoidal, uh, with esophageal bleed versus hemorrhoidal is hemorrhoidal bleed is easier to stop via uh, um, conventional methods like uh, prednisone suppositories or something else or surgery or just banding in the office and usually hemorrhoidal bleed is not as severe as esophageal but again this is a true medical emergency and needs to be addressed very quickly any type of blood vomiting from patients 
uh, any blood coming out from patient's mouth, it's an emergency, especially if it's a significant amount. Most likely bright red blood will signify esophageal bleed or esophageal pericele bleed, while um, coffee ground emesis most likely is uh, bleeding ulcer and uh, melanin is also can represent of anything because melanin is nothing but swallowed and digested blood but esophageal bleed is again very emergent and in addition to, um, the treatment in addition to is a um, endoscopical banding patient may be prescribed beta blockers to reduce the pressure in portal system um, because of the increased pressure in venous system, blood, uh, I'm sorry, the blood, the fluids will be uh, sipping through the vein and um, they will be uh, collecting in abdominal cavity and causing ascites. Patient may need interventions as paracentesis to remove extra fluid. And sometimes patient will need lots of um, will uh, produce lots of fluid, three to four uh, liters or more at one paracentesis session. To deal with ascites, the um, treatment uh, may include diuretics, and diuretics we may have aldactone, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, aldactone and Lasix uh, mix or combination of aldactone and Lasix to reduce ascites. Uh, so hepatic encephalopathy, um, hepatic encephalopathy is uh, uh, another complication related and this is secondary to uh, build up of ammonia and waste materials and causing cognitive changes. And So when we're getting into hepatic encephalopathy, um, liver doesn't work well and uh, the toxins are building up. Ammonia uh, getting more and more abundant in the blood and it's getting uh, into the brain and also neurotoxins resulting from hepatic failure. Um, ammonia is not uh, recycled and it's not taken out and uh, it will affect the brain function and uh, a patient will start having personality changes, confusion, memory loss, uh, unusual behaviors and patient may become comatose and die because of that. Ammonia N um, levels uh, need to be reduced uh, and uh, the most common treatment nowadays is still uh, lactulose although there are other treatments which by antibiotics uh, which may cause the decrease of ammonia but uh, lactulose is very uh, unpleasant treatment patient will have diarrhea and uh, non-compliance is quite common and when patient starts being non-compliance, uh, they will eventually slip into personality changes and confusions and even end up in the hospital. So um, at that time, uh, again, the lactulose or other treatments may be reintroduced. But there are more and more antibiotic oral treatments that may help with this versus lactulose. So let's talk about viral hepatitis here. Uh, Hepatitis A and B and C. And um, I would like to talk today only about A, a and B. And E and uh, G, like you see here, very uncommon in US. D is requiring presence of the B for activation. So A, B, and C are the most common types. And uh, those are viral diseases that will affect the liver. Hepatitis A, fecal oral transmission, and 
it can be excreted in um, feces, bile, and serum of uh, the patient. And fecal oral route is most common. And again, it can be from crowded unsanitary conditions, also food and water contamination. Water contamination sometimes uh, having a shellfish and shrimp or oysters from that lived in contaminated water, especially shell oysters, which uh, may be consumed raw. And uh, food usually it's unfortunately it's a restaurant outbreak there are studies done that restaurant the chances of completely recovering for a restaurant after hepatitis a outbreak three to five years so that much like financial and reputation damage done but for the patient is the good news it's usually patient most of the patients will combat this by themselves on uh, having palliative care really and do not require medication and hospitalization uh, but um, it's definitely high morbidity disease low mortality high morbidity and um, patients will be affected by this uh, they should be on somewhat isolation uh, like contact isolation at least and their um, feces have to be um, isolated and decontaminated sometimes so it brings lots of infectious control issues also it brings also food service issues this usually shouldn't happen but it does and it's usually come from one person who didn't wash hands after going to bathroom and serving food so uh, bottom line is don't eat out as much as you like eating out you are not the one who cooks that food and you there is no guarantee that you won't have hepatitis A although it's understandable that every facility every restaurant makes every effort to not uh, introduce foodborne disease but the chances of getting hepatitis A are higher if you eat outside versus you cook your own food besides you will save lots of money on that too so the bottom line is this is disease with high morbidity very low mortality it's debilitating and it will take lots of um, long time for patient to get back to normal but usually patient will recover themselves approximately 10 percent people or so may have a bad uh, liver failure and um, may need further in interventions from hepatitis a but usually those people who have already some type of liver condition and uh, hepatitis C or cirrhosis that's why it's important if you have a patient with hepatitis C or B to immunize them for hepatitis A because that will prevent he development of hepatitis A on the top of hepatitis B or C hepatitis B is transmitted through contact with blood and body fluid so it, it's not fecal oral route anymore it's a body fluid transmission um, maternal transmission can happen and uh, vaccine is available and if you work in healthcare it's certainly a good idea to have vaccination treatment is also available for antiviral treatment for hepatitis B However, um, again, the treatment process is very lengthy and uh, the result may not be, uh, there is no 100% um, cure or 100% effective treatment for hepatitis B. Um, the contamination or transmission occurs again through blood, body fluid, sexual contact, and contaminated needles. However, the rates of hepatitis B nationwide are much lower versus rates of hepatitis C. 
So hepatitis C is another blood-borne disease. Um, there are many sources speculated about hepatitis C transmission. Uh, sexual contact is uh, blame, also like body fluids, but there is more and more evidence that hep C is uh, truly blood-borne disease. It's not going through blood body fluids much. And uh, IV drug use is uh, certainly implicated and uh, transfusion, blood transfusion uh, can be used to be one of the causes of hepatitis C transmission but nowadays we screen blood very thoroughly and this is uh, virtually impossible to get hepatitis C or HIV from blood transfusion nowadays. But um, Approximately 50 to 80 percent of hepatitis C will result in chronic hepatitis and uh, it all depends, 50 to 80 percent depends on genotype. So this is, but um, small percentage, approximately 20 percent on average or less even, may uh, develop immunity to hepatitis C and cure hepatitis C by themselves, patients. But um, they will be um, certainly, um, what I'm trying to say, people who develop immunity by themselves to hepatitis C are a focus of um, some studies trying to find vaccine for C which is not available or uh, further learn more about hepatitis C and try to find more efficient medication. There are uh, antiviral preparations for hepatitis C available and the treatment is available and there is a approximately, depending on the type of genotype of C, cure rate can go up to 80% and like 50 to 80%. Again, I will not be asking you on exam or elsewhere that percentages of cure rates or um, the, the epidemiology and statistics, so this is just FYI information. But treatment is available and um, hepatitis C stays long, very dormant and nowadays Usually, it's uh, accidental discovery on routine blood test when patient present with elevated liver enzymes. Further uh, workup will show that patient has hepatitis C. And uh, sometimes the re source of the disease is absolutely unknown, or uh, we don't know where patient received it, but they may have contamination with needle uh, 20 years ago or they did some drug 30 years ago they don't remember but sometimes patients just have no clue where this appeared and again treatment is available so every time you see your patient has hepatitis C you may decide elect you, not you may elect you need to refer them for hepatology clinic or gastroenterology clinic for further evaluation and treatment Again, brief hepatitis, the rest of hepatitis infections. D is uh, fairly rare. It needs the hepatitis B for replication. So if patient doesn't have B, there is no way to develop hepatitis D. E is another type of hepatitis. It's uh, virtually unknown in the United States, although with influx of immigration, this may be increasing, but it, it's another hepatitis with fecal oral transmission. And the G is um, one of the newest hepatitis, and it's uh, parenteral and sexually transmitted uh, route. Um, major piece of information I want you to remember from this slide, it's about hepatitis D, that D needs hepatitis B for replication. That's a common a question I would ask probably or elsewhere you'll be asked, but a patient cannot have hepatitis B without hepatitis B. So D needs B.
In general, when hepatitis in infection occurs, this following sequence takes place. Uh, they will have incubation phase, which is different from different types, prodromal, pre-ecteric phase when patient turns gender, before patient turns gender, and ecteric pre uh, phase when patient develops gender, and uh, recovery phase. Uh, if patient is having chronic hepatitis B or C, they may not even get into icteric phase. Uh, because uh, icteric phase is very remarkable in hepatitis A. And usually uh, there are some lucky people who had infections with uh, B and C and they were able to recover themselves without any drugs. If they don't recover B and C, they will slip into phase of chronic hepatitis and gradual deterioration of the liver. Fulminant hepatitis appears from one or the other cause when the hepatocytes getting impaired and necrotic and also acute liver failure can result from Tylenol overdose. Getting more and more serious nowadays, this, uh, the Tylenol overdose. Um, the recent one I learned was buying sleep aids, Benadryl-based, uh, like night, NyQuil, uh, or not NyQuil, I'm sorry, Benadryl PM, uh, which, um, or Tylenol PM, and taking it because uh, the sedative uh, qualities of it and overdosing on uh, Tylenol as an additional drug, although drug seeker is looking for Benadryl sedative qualities. But again, can be suicidal attempt to have uh, acetamine overdose. And uh, this is a true liver emergency. And I know the whole lecture today was about emergencies and true emergencies, but this is one of the uh, worst situations you can deal if a patient presents with acute hepatic failure and acetaminophen overdose. This most of the time requires liver transplant and because liver will have very um, small chances to recover. However, some patients may recover and overcome the acetamine overdose. But again, it's a true emergency. If you are facing something like this with your patients, this is uh, need to be addressed on the, with the closest transplant clinic and patient needs to be trans maybe uh, given transplant liver if they are candidate and if they meet all the criteria. This is different whole ball game. I don't want to go in there, but uh, what you need to take from here, acetamine overdose will result in acute hepatic failure, which may require liver transplant. Cirrhosis is the disruption of liver function and structure. The function of liver is lost and uh, it turn into liver tissue will turn into nodular and then fibrotic and fibrosis. There will be less and less biliary channels and uh, liver becoming more and more obstructed and will cause portal hypertension. Um, because of that, blood doesn't go to the places in liver where it usually goes, so it also adds, fibrosis adds to developing the necrosis. So uh, cirrhosis is a sequela of either hepatitis or alcohol-induced hepatitis, but uh, and cirrhosis is not reversible. Even patient, let's say, stop drinking, but we still will have cirrhosis. So liver function is lost. Um, cirrhosis brings lots of other different issues of portal hypertension, like we talked, and also a different other um, uh, problems 
such as uh, biliary obstruction, jaundice, uh, ascites, secondary, and uh, hepatic encephalopathy. But overall, patients will have liver failure and death secondary to that. A patient with cirrhosis may be candidates for the transplant, and um, unfortunately, uh, patient needs to be abstaining from alcohol or any other sub illicit substances for six months to be considered a candidate and most of the time, or not most of the time, but sometime patient just will continue using alcohol and illicit substances and will not be qualified as transplant recipient. So cirrhosis can be alcoholic because alcohol puts lots of taxing on the liver. Um, alcohol damages hepatocytes. Every time you drink alcohol, you cause some damage to your liver. Um, so avoiding alcohol completely is maybe the best thing you can do for your liver, but um, drinking shouldn't be excessive by no means. Binge drinking especially can cause severe damage, of course. Um, this may uh, result in damage of hepatocyte. After ingestion of alcohol, everybody will, you will have somewhat elevated liver enzymes, although cirrhotic liver does not have elevated liver enzyme because most of the hepatocytes are damaged, so there is nothing much to damage. So biliary cirrhosis, um, this is a different disease which where uh, cirrhosis will start in bile ducts and uh, it, it's actually called primary biliary cirrhosis, it's autoimmune disorder and um, uh, there are ways to treat it for with, uh, uh, with medication that will work on the, um, the immunity itself versus secondary biliary cirrhosis, secondary to obstruction. Um, in this point, um, alcoholic disease is definitely much more common than uh, biliary disease. Post-necrotic is the consequence of chron chronic disease, again, losing blood supply to the liver and getting less and less blood supply and necrotizing the liver. The last slide I'd like to talk is disorder of pancreas and disorder of pancreas as pancreatitis. So uh, two major causes of pancreatitis. There can be, first of all, can be autoimmune pancreatitis, but it's not common. But two major causes, alcohol and gallstone or cholelithiasis. Um, what happen in both cases both of the substances will cause injury to pancreatic cells and duct, and um, leakage will occur of the enzyme into pancreatic tissue and having self-digestion of the pancreas and uh, then leaking into blood vessels and causing damage locally and to other organs. But this, uh, uh, at this point, I want you to know these two sources. Alcohol as a toxic substance to pancreatic cells and duct. And if alcohol has an influx somehow into pancreatic ducts, it will cause um, destruction right there. When we're having cholelithiasis, small stones, small gallstones can go upward through the pancreatic duct and actually call blockage and cause severe pancreatitis. Um, in that case, um, ERCP may be recommended to remove the duct obstruction and just to release the uh, inflammation of the pancreas. And the pa after that, patient will have marked improvement within hours if the release is done, and if the obstruction and pancreatitis is secondary to 
uh, biliary stone. Alcohol related, the treatment will include the MPO status, so not to encourage pancreas to produce any digestive enzymes and uh, also hydration and most of the time. Also patient has to be consulted heavily about uh, alcoholism and consequence of uh, pancreatitis. Although sometime you would see when patient come with alcohol related pancreatitis, I had several people who had quit drinking after third or fourth reoccurring pancreatitis uh, attack and um, they finally made that correlation between alcohol and pancreas and uh, it I can only imagine how hard it was to do that but dealing with pain and hospitalization every time uh, is also very difficult and patient talking about pain patient also will require pain management um, while they are hospitalized there are other sources, obstructive sources, like dysfunction of sphincter of Audi, but at this point for this course, I want to limit our conversation to this, and uh, this will conclude our lecture. Thank you very much, and call me and email me if you have any questions. Have a great day.